Ye. We're going to go ahead and get started with the hey, urban. Yep. All right, Betsy with the gavel there. Uh, we're going to get started with the Urban Experience Committee meeting for April 8th. It doesn't look like we need to do minutes. Did we move those to legislative? Great. So we're going to get started with the paper cuts code text amendments with Spencer Gardner, who's not filling in. Okay. I was like, who's not here? So great. Well, thank you for coming. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. Um, my name is Jackie Churchill, and I'll walk you through the paper cuts code amendments today. Um, and so we do have quite a few items on this and of the paper cut code amendment. So I'm just gonna go through to a high level very quickly. And if you have any questions um, for more details, please just let me know. Um, so first off, paper cuts are just small changes that the planning department is making to the SMC, um, mostly to address small problems in accuracy and clarity. And there are a few that um, are a little bit more complex, that take a little bit more staff time and engagement. But overall, these are very simple changes um, that shouldn't be a, a project of their own. So we're grouping them all together. All right, so the first one we have is the membership for the Bicycle Advisory Board, and we are amending this to allow the 11th member to be between the ages of 16 and 22. The next two items are in the B definitions of, for building coverage and building footprint. We amended building coverage to make it more clear, and then we added a definition for building footprint. The next is in H definitions for household, and we amended this to be consistent with the RCW. And then we amended limited use standards for commercial parking to make it clear that commercial parking on surface lots in office retail and office zones is not a permitted use. Um, next in the center and corridor zone allowed uses, we removed a duplicate table and we referenced the same table in the center and corridor zone allowed use table section, which we did amend. We added a new allowed use, once again, to clarify that surface lot commercial parking lots are not allowed in the center and corridor zones. The next proposed amendment is actually a new section we added to define public parking lot. And then the next is medical centers. We amended to classify them to correct the classification of emergency medical care centers as office. The next amendment is in street tree requirements and we changed the individual planting area um, for the downtown zone to be um, align with current practices. We expanded it from six feet to eight feet maximum width. And then we amended the section for the concurrency test to reflect current city practices and to be more clear. And in a similar way, we amended the certificate of capacity section once again to reflect current city practices and to be more clear. Um, then we also amended the impact fee schedule. Um, to add an impact fee for attached housing and to also implement the annual update for the impact fee schedule. Um, next, under the amendment frequency section, we remove section G, subsection G, because it references develop regulations, development regulations, um, in a section that talks about the comprehensive plan review process, and so it was out of place and we removed it. Then in the next one is summary of land use application procedures. Um, in this one, we fixed a mistake that had taken place when previously updating the table for housing changes last year. So the next item is the notice of decision. This was originally amended just to fix some grammatical errors. And this was amended again after the public commission hearing um, just to further clarify and fix grammatical errors. So we're just requesting a substitution for that. And the changes are in um, the highlighted section, at, as you can see on the slide. Um, the next one is development standards for lot size transitions. Um, this is in 17G, planned unit developments. We removed the reference to the lot size transition to align with the current practices. 
And then finally, we have alleys, and we clarified language in subsection B, and we removed subsection H because it was duplicative with subsection G. And then this also had some grammar that was corrected after the plan commission hearing, and so we were requesting a substitution for that as well. All right, and that is the last. Are there any questions? Councilman Bingle. Uh, on um, the appendix for the impact fee schedule, uh, is this an increase that's coming in this year? Um, so it actually didn't, for this particular item, did not increase the impact fees. It just created a separate section Defined for the attached, for housing. attached housing. Okay. Yeah, and it's, the attached housing, I believe, is actually lower than the single housing mm -hmm. um, impact fee. Okay. Um, I'll just add, uh, the addition of attached housing was one of the comments that came during the process of um, amending the impact fees last year. Mm -hmm. There was a comment that the, the, sub, the prior version that we have been using does not have attached housing, so this adds that to rectify that problem. Yeah, and I just know that on GFCs we had uh, an escalator that was happening on there, but I don't remember us putting that in for impact fees, and that's what I just wanted to clarify because so on GFCs, it's tied to the ENR index, and so it goes up based on uh, construction costs every year. We don't have that for impact fees, though, correct? Um, I don't know if there's an escalator, but this particular change would be specific to the number of trips generated by a use, which wouldn't necessarily escalate over time. It's expected to be, uh, you know, it is whatever the numbers show. The fee itself wouldn't be amended by this. And I'm, I'm not sure, I guess, is the answer to your question. I can't remember I just, if we I just have want an to escalator. Make sure that we're not increasing fees here in, in the rest of this, because I think that's a separate conversation. Correct. This okay. does, this does okay. not increase fees. Okay. Um, Where's it? And then the, the street tree requirements downtown from six to eight feet, that was just to make it to where it was more feasible for people to put trees in downtown, correct? Is that? Yes, and that's something that they were already doing. They were building to that right. width already. Okay. Let's move recapture. Yes, uh, all of these but two uh, kind of called out either grammatical or clarify or aligns with current practice. And one was the impact fee, which was already discussed. The other was the bicycle. And I'm just kind of wondering on that, is that a change to the bicycle uh, committee's uh, structure by having that? Because I know we've had youth-oriented positions on committees going back 15 or so years. But um, So, yes, yeah, so we do have that youth position already. And this is a change. It's just expanding the age range. Be Previous to this amendment, it was um, limited to people younger than 18, and that was just found to be too limiting. Um, people couldn't stay on the board long enough for it to really make an impact. So we wanted to expand it. But if you're appointing somebody who's 21, is that not a very different perspective than someone who's 15 or 16? Um, if, if, the, if the goal is youth, youth perspective, I'm just... Yeah, um, I don't know. I think... That could be debated, but I think we wanted a, you know, a young adult, older teenager's perspective. Somebody, so that was the goal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I also forgot to mention that there was um, some, a request to add two items to the agenda that are just for information. Uh, one's a shelter, shelter audit and the other is fair housing. Um, that was from Don. There were some technical issues, one with us having break, but two, um, just adding things to the agenda. They had communicated it, but forgot to actually click submit to add it. So it was communicated before the deadline, but not submitted. So just wanted to make sure that everyone was okay with adding that, unless there was an objection. Okay, great. No objection. <laughs> All right, uh, then we we'll go. So that'll be added to the end for 13, 14. So we'll go to item two, which is a multifamily tax exemption update with Amanda. And then Amanda, while you're up here, you want to also do the next one too? Thanks, Jacoby. Yeah. Good afternoon. So yes, um, council members opponent, I will do them both together if oh, that's, that's all right great. with you guys. They're somewhat related. Since we have some new council members, just to go over some background, this will help explain the whys. First, let's talk about multifamily tax exemption or MFTE. Generally, what we're looking at is a statewide incentive, primarily property tax. It's meant to encourage rehabilitation or construction of new affordable housing. And we'll talk about what we mean by affordable on a slide coming up. 
Um, it's also about increasing income diversity and then getting more workforce housing. So what that translates on the property owner or developer side is you can get a tax benefit just under $1,200 for every 100,000 of construction value for that new housing that you're creating. Um, for our community, what we're getting is guaranteed income and rent restricted units for a given time frame. There are three different time limits for the tax exemptions. 8, 12, and the recently added 20 year, which I'll also go into detail on in another slide. So we focus on two different areas in this city. Um, when we updated our economic development strategy to have the Spokane target investment area, that's the area in red, um, we are defining that as economically distressed census tracts. So they have a high poverty rate, that's over 20%. The median family income is under 80% area median income. Um, the unemployment rate could be high. It could be all three of those, only two. It's a, it's a distressed in many ways sort of census tract, if you will. So this allows for the eight, 12, and 20 year exemptions. And then the, re the remainder of the city is the affordable housing emphasis area. So this, again, could be all three. It could have a lower poverty rate, but a high unemployment rate, or a mix of all of those. Um, tends to be less distressed, if you will, census tracts. And this area of the city, or these areas of the city, we only allow for the 12 and 20 year, which are the income and rent restricted tax exemption programs. So. Area median income. This is what we're talking about when we say affordable. The state RCWs outline that the MFTE program can allow for low income to moderate income households. So low income is gonna be less than 80% AMI, and then the moderate goes up to 115% AMI. Um, the way that staff approaches MFT program for Spokane is to complement the work that CHHS does. So we focus on workforce housing, so that's the 80 to 115% AMI. And that chart just gives you an idea of if you're a single person, what AMI, what are you making if you're at 80%, 100% AMI, all the way up to five household, five person household. Okay, so the tax exemptions. The first one is the eight year. It is market rate, so there are no income or rent restrictions on any of the units. Um, this is also one that we recently updated, so if you're gonna do student housing, you can only use this program. And part of the reason we've done that is because it is challenging actually pinning down the details on student income. Um, it's often zero, but then mom and dad might be paying, and so technically, mom and dad's income should count towards whether they income qualify for a unit or not. So it gets a little bit tricky, and so for administration, we've just updated our code to say, if you're doing student housing, do the eight-year program. You still get a tax break if you're the property owner or developer, so it's still getting new units. Um, the big ones that we focus on are the 12-year and then the 20 year. So the 12 year is workforce housing or affordable housing. Depending on how many units you do, you're gonna have a different percentage. It's not super different between the two, but 25 to 30% of units need to be income and rent restricted for 12 years. And then the 20 year is the newest one that the state adopted just a couple years ago. Um, I think we're one of a few localities across the state that has this in our code. Um, what we've found from talking to developers and other municipalities, it's, it's kind of difficult the way that the code is written. So I think this is why we haven't seen any applications come in under the 12 year yet, because the state requires that there's a deed restriction for the 25% permanently affordable, which really tends to split up the site design and makes it a little bit tricky, especially with Washington state condo laws. Um, so you, you end up having kind of two different things happening. You have maybe traditional multifamily in a larger building and then the permanently affordable and you need to design your site in such a way that you're not segregating the affordable units and they share the same amenities and it's supposed to be about a mix of incomes and residents and it's just proving to be a little bit challenging. Um, but since we've made some code amendments, we've seen a big increase in the number of 12-year applications coming in, which we're really excited about. Um, and as we move forward and do updates like this in the future, I think you'll start to see that, because that update was only back in 2022, so there's still a fair amount of active or finalized MFTEs that are under the eight-year program. 
So as far as what we're talking about for active, these ones um, span the city in type and unit size. We have 2,351 units, 731 of those are income and rent restricted. Um, give you a breakdown by the districts as far as where they are and whether they're eight or 12 year. And then these are the ones that finalized last year. And so as I was saying, we still have a fair amount coming in under the eight year exemption, but so a conditional MFTE certificate or contract, excuse me, is valid for three years for construction. And so many of these probably, you know, initiated in 2020, between 2020 and 2023. And so they could have come in under our old code and therefore didn't have access to the expanded 12 year MFTE program. Um, another thing since I've started working under Terry Sharps in economic development is kind of highlighting for people what the multifamily tax exemption properties look like. So they span the gamut. Um, Haystack Heights, which is the city's first cooperative housing project, is a 12-year MFTE program, or eight-year, excuse me. Kendall Yards was also an MFTE program. Um, the Boxcar and the Warren are new projects and more traditional large building multifamily. They span all of the districts and different sizes, especially now that building opportunity for housing with the missing middle housing code changes have happened. Developers have much more options in regard to what they're building. And then parking to people. This shares a lot of similarities with how we administer the multifamily tax exemption program, and so that's why I wanted to do them at the same time. Um, the intent here, the legislature wants to redevelop underutilized parking lots. And when we say parking lots, we mean just surface parking, so no structured parking or anything like that. Um, and this is similar but different to the multifamily tax exemption program. This is a sales and use tax deferral. So think the construction sales taxes that you would pay on the project, you're getting to defer as long as you remain compliant and then they would be forgiven completely and no clawbacks to worry about. Same as MFTE, this was written such that you could target low to moderate income and so we have also focused this program on the 80 to 115 percent AMI. Okay, so this was rolled out and we are still, as far as I know, as of today, I think we're the only municipality in the state this has, that has adopted this in our code. Um, it has been an interesting path to navigate with Department of Revenue. So the way this is written out, when they say parking lot, it's a little bit squishy. So it doesn't require striping, it doesn't have to be paved, it doesn't have to have signage. It cannot have a no parking sign because that will invalidate you. Um, the other thing that is a big catch that is just conveniently tucked away in the definitions where you may not look is that the parking lot has to have been in existence as of or before June 9th, 2022, when the state adopted this. Um, so that poses some interesting questions going forward because the sunset pushes us well towards 2040. So if, let's say a parking lot's developed and becomes defunct for some reason, we wouldn't be able to redevelop it, which is unfortunate. Um, I think we'll probably keep pushing Department of Revenue on how they interpret this because it's, it's kind of helpful right now. It certainly is if you have traditional parking lots to redevelop. Um, but interestingly enough, they did not define what a parking lot is, which seems common sense, but is kind of important here because there are parking lots that are accessory to a building, and then there are parking lots that are commercial parking, so standalone parking lots. Um, and knowing the way the Department of Revenue is gonna look at that is very important. It helps us give better direction to developers when they come in to talk about this incentive. So the sales and use tax is equivalent to about 9% with our taxes and local levy rate. So for every $900 you, um, or you're saving $900 for every 10,000 that you're spending on construction of the new units. 
that covers construction supplies, um, buying amenities for common areas, maintenance and services. I need to double check with Department of Revenue because this is also not 100% clear. I think it should also cover soft costs like architectural or engineering services once construction has begun. Um, and then the, the great thing about this program is it requires 50% of the units to be income and rent restricted for 10 years. Um, and luckily that 50% doesn't seem like too much of a barrier. Our local developers have been like, yeah, we can do that. I think this works, particularly given the AMI range that we're looking at. So same AMI range as multifamily tax exemption. I think that's what kind of makes this work for our area is that we've tailored it to our unique landscape with the type of infill lots that we have and then also the income ranges for residents. So this one is still targeting workforce housing. The application process, just to highlight, so if you're out there talking to constituents about a particular site they might want to redevelop, it's very similar to multifamily tax exemption. You need to apply before you do any submitting to our developer services center. No building permits, no plan reviews. So you submit an application to us at the city. We review. Um, we do everything informally right now just because things are still somewhat gray with Department of Revenue. So we're fielding questions from developers as they find sites that they think might be applicable. And we'll do site visits if it's necessary um, to give them an idea if we think that the Department of Revenue will support saying yes to this. Um, interestingly, the way that the legislature wrote this, the city that adopts an ordinance has the authority to approve or deny an application. Department of Revenue does not, which puts us in an interesting position because if we think something qualifies, but Department of Revenue doesn't, they don't have a way to deny it. Um, but they can definitely not feel good about it. <laughs> um, but so you'll apply to the city, we'll give you a conditional contract similar to MFTE, and then you'll turn around to Department of Revenue, give them our conditional certificate, fill out their application, which there's a little snippet on, um, on the screen of. It's pretty short, it's just a one pager. Uh, and then your, your contract with us is good for three years for construction. You can ask for an extension if you need it. And then the Department of Revenue issues a certificate that says, hey, I don't pay sales tax, which is great. So you wanna make sure that you get that all lined up before you start construction anyway, because it, they don't allow for retroactively paying for things um, if you happen to do some work beforehand. And then obviously, once you get your certificate of occupancy, you need to notify the Department of Revenue. Yes, Council Member Cathcart. Well, I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering, if DOR can't deny what the city approves, why would we care? I mean, honestly, until, uh, unless and until the legislature buttons up their legislation, yeah. why would we care? I don't think that they would, but my only concern, so the one <coughs> stick that they have is the clawback okay. um, or apportionment. Amanda was kind of getting right to the point. Number one, we don't want to catch our applicants by surprise when they go to get their um, <clears throat> deferral from DOR. We want to know that DOR can support what we have approved. So we're making certain of that before we move them forward. There, at first, DOR felt that they could do a yes or no denial. Unfortunately, the RCW does not allow them to do that. And then they thought it could be uh, via apportionment. Well, the RCW doesn't allow a apportionment either. So it's been a give and take with DOR, and our legal team has been really supportive in helping us move it forward. But so, so how do they claw back then? What's the threat of clawback? They could turn around and tell people that they're, after their project is constructed that it didn't meet the requirements, and then they could take it back. But Honestly, they can't. So they can't deny up front, but they could on the back end is what you're saying. They could Got if it. they felt it. It's so that's where we're trying to be really careful, make certain okay. our projects are moving forward accordingly. That's crazy. Thank, Thank you, you, Amanda. Um, not to get too far into the weeds, but we'll eventually come to talk to you guys about the recent um, Senate Bill 6175. Um, 
it's the same sort of sales and use tax idea, but you can tell that the Department of Revenue was more involved because they did write in some language about apportionment on sites. Um, so really just what it has translated into is our economic development staffers ha have just gotten really nitpicky. We don't like to, but I think it's much easier to talk to developers about this incentive is off the table, unfortunately, for them to be like, oh, I can save 9%, and then us come back afterwards. It really messes with their pro formas. The, the Senate bill, is that the conversion? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It doesn't have a catchy name, but it is the conversion of existing commercial into residential housing. That's a catchy name. <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful. Uh, do we have to do any council action to implement that conversion program or? Yes, similarly? so we'll need to do an ordinance to adopt it. Um, it is not effective at the state level until June 6th. But, and we already have that working, right? That's, Correct. Yeah, yeah. And then um, any other questions? I had a question about, um, what it translates translates to for rent. So you gave us the AMI for income, but I don't know if you have a similar table for what that looks like for rent. It depends. So we have tried to break things down both by household and then by unit. So a studio versus like a two bedroom is gonna be slightly different. I, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't think to put that on a slide, but I can email it to you guys to give you an idea, and we would update that annually also, based on the same numbers that we use for the program with the HUD income. That would be great, because I know I hear that often, of people asking, what is rent for 115% AMI? And like, I don't know, it depends on how many units, and so if you have yes. a table, that would be really helpful. It, it basically is a range, so if you think about, like, a studio could be from X to Y, and then it's going to kind of be pegged a little bit to whoever that household is, like if it's two person versus one person. Um, yes, I will send an email to follow up on that. All right, well, thank you for these updates. It's very exciting to hear all the construction that's happening, and thank you all for your hard work on that, especially navigating new paths like that. Yeah. All right, next we have the Plan Commission Work Program with Spencer, who apparently is here just in the back hiding. Uh, thank you, council members. Um, I did want to make one clarification on the paper cuts. I, uh, my staff alerted me to the fact that the impact fees do include a change to the impact fees. When the impact fees were, the changes were adopted last year, there is written in there a correction for uh, the engineering news record index annually. So in the impact fees and not GFCs. In the impact fees. Okay. Correct. So the sorry to be hijacking for paper cuts, but in the paper cuts that you saw, there are actually changes proposed to the fees consistent with that uh, yeah. inflationary index. Okay. So I'm sorry I m misstated that. Um, the Plan Commission Work Program, I don't have anything to present here. The, um, the list is there in your packet. Um, these are the items that um, on the administrative side, we've, uh, uh, most of these are continuing, honestly, from last year. Um, I've tried to break out some of the state mandated work. That's honestly a large, um, the, the majority of our work over the next two years is really gonna be state mandated work. Either updates to our code um, through recent legislative action or the 2026 comprehensive plan update. So the vast majority of our work is gonna be focused on those state mandated things. There are some items in here um, that came out of uh, conversations with uh, council members, plan commission, and the mayoral administration. So um, we're, we're, we're trying to um, orient ourselves towards almost like a two year work program. It, we expect to continue to update it annually, but since most of these items end up taking multiple years, I've listed it as a 2024 to 2025 Plan Commission work program, just recognizing that some of these items may not occur until next year or will occur this year and run into next year as well. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on any specific items if you have any. Just, just looking at the list, and I'm not seeing any specifically stricken items. Were there items that were removed and they're not included on this? Uh, I did remove items that are completed. Okay. Um, I do have a version that identifies things that were removed. Um, again, most of those were items that were completed. 
Um, I could certainly follow up with you and share the version that has some removed items from it if you want to see those. Just a, a quick scan. Uh, the one I'm not seeing, and I, I think it was combined with something else when we approved it, is the tiny lot development. Um, we, let me look here. Um, we do have a line in there for manuf manufactured housing updates, and I think that was... Uh, uh, we, this was more cottage, something, something to do with cottage that we had combined it with. And I'm not seeing either on here now. Yeah, I know on the cottage side, our updates in November um, addressed a lot of the concerns around cottage housing um, and would also address tiny housing, for example, um, depending on the type of tiny housing. If it's on wheels, it's treated differently in our code than it would be if it's on a foundation. But if it's on a foundation with the cottage housing updates that we made, I don't anticipate there would be any problems with that. Well, I think the issue was, you know, we've been talking for four years about these, uh, uh, you know, tiny homes uh, for, for people who are experiencing homelessness and what would be the standard um, rules around building tiny homes within a neighborhood, within, you know, anywhere in the city. Can we, you know, create a tiny lot that could be a fee simple tiny home um, that would be smaller than perhaps the, smaller, the smallest lots that we currently allow under code? So, so that was the point of that item that we had put on there maybe two years ago now. Yeah, so the, um, I guess there's two, I, I guess I have a comment and then a question. The first is the comment um, with our housing update, there is a route now for creating a lot around a tiny home with no, basically no restriction on the size of that lot. So that particular issue I believe has been resolved. Um, there, there has been discussion in the past with you and others about a tiny home community arranged around kind of a common building that provides things like laundry services or bathrooms or things like that. Um, that is, I, I don't remember if that was really explicitly part of the work program in the past. If that is still something that you would like to see well, in there, we can, we I, can talk I, Wouldn't about that. that be allowed right now under like a PUD or something? Because I feel like you can already, because those would not be fee simple. Those would be almost for sure rental or leased. It would, it would almost be like a shelter situation. Yeah. And, and yes, we think that that is a possibility in most of our zones. I, I don't know that we would, um, we'd have to think about whether that's a, a possibility in the R1 and R2 zones. But it's certainly in commercial zones, we believe that that's already an allowed use. Because my, my point was, there was a lot of talk, still is not quite to the same level, uh, around allowing some of these to go forward that might not have the, the services and amenities that houses typically that are built would have to be built to, right? They could get around some of those codes. Uh, and so, you know, when it comes to bathroom fixtures or kitchen amenities or things like that, they wouldn't have to provide those. And so I want to make sure that whatever that looks like, and I don't not necessarily have a one way or the other, but I want to make sure that it's standardized so that if you're building a tiny home in Indian Trail or one in Hilliard or one on the South Hill, there is a code that you're building to that, you know, in my, you know that, that lays that out so that we have some consistency and standards when it comes to tiny lot development. Um, yeah, so again, there's those two types. Um, the one that is almost more like a shelter type. The second type, um, there wouldn't be any difference from the zoning side, whether you're building an Indian Trail or South Hill or Hilliard. Um, there may be some building code uh, considerations there, but again, those wouldn't really apply based on a specific geography. Um, I guess from the zoning side, I don't see any, any problem currently with somebody wanting to do that. Again, with the distinction between a, a tiny house that's on a foundation versus one that's on wheels. Um, the one that's on wheels, uh, I think we, we do have some, there's some challenges for implementing that within our code. Um, and I, I don't think that's been, yeah. uh, there's been a desire to really address that specifically, but yeah. on a foundation, there would be no problem. Okay. Um, if you're, if you're meeting, you know, the basic definition of a living unit. Okay. So. Any other questions? I just had one about, uh, we had discussed about parking minimum for commercial districts. It doesn't look like that's on the list or is that somewhere different? Um, I know we discussed that, and I'm trying to remember if that's on here somewhere. Um, we have had some conversations about that as part of our centers and corridors study. Um, I mean, it kind of fits in there. I think if there's a desire to add that item, that's certainly something that could be added. 
Um, so a, a number of these are TBD, and I'm just wanting to understand maybe what your thought is as to when we would address them, uh, specifically neighborhood mixed use, uh, uh, which I assume would include neighborhood retail, which is a big thing I've been pushing for, and then uh, neighborhood plans, which I can't tell you how frequently I get an email from Shiloh Hills about <laughs> wanting their plan done. So yeah. what, what do you think is, is the expected timeline for those? Um, it kind of depends on the item. So neighborhood mixed use is a good example. Um, that one will take some comprehensive plan work in order for us to implement on the code side. And um, we are doing some work through our Centers and Corridors study to, uh, I guess, introduce that, the topic within the, the public engagement that we're doing and start to think about how that might work in our code. Um, but that particular issue is one that we expect to address during the 2026 Comprehensive Plan update. So that, um, the TBD, I guess, means we will be addressing it during our, during our work over the next two years as the comprehensive plan update, and that, that would not be finalized until 2026. Um, on the neighborhood plans, that is, and, and kind of has been for a while now, an item that uh, we hope to address as our resources allow, and given the last couple of years and the, the severity of the housing crisis and other issues that we've been dealing with, we've just not had resources to put towards the neighborhood plans. We want to keep them in there, recognizing that there is an intent to do them, but we're not sure when that capacity will be available. One, one quick on the neighborhood uh, retail. So, but theoretically, if there was work being done right now to, to really move that forward, we could pass something interim in the interim that would allow that to take effect, correct? We don't need to wait till 26. Um, I think that would be a little challenging simply because in the comprehensive plan, it is so specific about not allowing the neighborhood retail okay. um, in most areas. And in general, we need our comprehensive plan to be, or our development code to be consistent. The interim strategy that we used for Boca, for example, was a little bit different because the state had specifically given us essentially a carve out from some of the um, GMA requirements around comprehensive plans and development code. And so we had the backing from the state essentially to make that change on an interim basis. We don't have the same uh, leeway from the state on neighborhood retail, so okay. I think there would be some concerns there. All right, last question because we got to move on. Yeah, I, and we've talked about this uh, before on the availability of resources for neighborhood retail, but we did, you know, the resolution that I, I sponsored and put forward specifically asking for this to be done. Do you have sort of a, a timeline on that because, uh, you know, it's been almost, you know, two years since we passed that resolution. Uh, you're talking about neighborhood-based re neighborhood retail or home-based occupations? We're, we're sort of combining the two here, right? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. They're, they're similar uh, topics. I know we've had some conversations about home-based occupation. I think on our side, the, uh, the capacity is not there to take that up. Home-based occupation might be um, a simple enough matter that if I think if you or other council members felt inclined to do some limited outreach, maybe a couple of town halls or something to get some neighborhood feedback or some community feedback around it. Um, we could make room in the plan commission schedule for it. I just don't think on the staff side we have the staff resources to head that effort up. Okay, and I think we, we had talked about that specific idea before, what you just uh, put forward. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm being reminded of this as we're, um, as we're going. I thought that we had put some money in uh, for this specific idea, am I, am I wrong on that? Um, I don't remember any funding being allocated specifically for that. Um, that it was like $170,000 we did a couple years ago for something along these lines. I could be wrong because I'm trying to remember it yeah, on the I'm spot. Not, that, that's not ringing a bell for me, but we could connect later. Okay. I mean, we, we, yeah. are, we have the ARPA money for neighborhood business districts. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's what you're thinking of. No. Well. Maybe we can connect later. That's and right. Okay. We'll Sounds figure good. that out. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We'll go on to the next one, which is a resolution to initiate climate planning under the comprehensive plan periodic update with MARN. And then you're also up for the next one, too, with the climate planning grant and resolution. Yes. And I have one more oh, after that. Oh, and one more. <laughs> and Smart Growth American Community Center. You just take it away. Sounds good. Um, I do have some slides. Is this something I use? Okay. 
Um, well, I can just share as we get going. So I'll talk a little bit about climate planning. Um, I know that there's been some updates or you've had some briefings uh, from Commerce about the comprehensive plan. And so this is a specific part of that that we'll be talking about and doing some work over the next two years. Um, so there we go. Um, the climate element was included in the comprehensive plans under the Growth Management Act um, from House Bill 1181. And it specifically calls us to develop um, a focus on greenhouse gas emissions and resilience. So greenhouse gas emissions looks at uh, reducing emissions and vehicle miles traveled. And then resilience is looking at uh, responding or preparing and responding to um, climate impacts and natural hazards. And then there's also a component to look at environmental justice so that we're not worsening the impacts of um, environmental health disparities. So that's the high level overview. We'll be going into this much more over the next couple months as we get into it, but um, that's kind of the, what the House Bill 1181 um, is directing cities to do. Just a quick slide on how this all works together because you'll um, we'll have some general comprehensive plan, uh, we'll have a lot of general comprehensive plan uh, process and discussion, and then we'll have specific climate process and discussion. And so they uh, were a little bit more, we're a little bit farther ahead with the climate work because of the grant that we got from Commerce that was released, the funds earlier, so we're able to move and kind of start that work. And then we'll be also addressing all of the other topics and um, elements within the comprehensive plan. Uh, but have those two kind of going simultaneously where we can go deep in climate planning and then we'll be combining them in the environmental impact statement um, probably towards the end of next year, which will look at growth alternatives. We'll have an environmental justice analysis as well. And then, of course, 2026 is our deadline for the city's comprehensive plan. So um, we'll also get into that in more detail and um, if there is questions on that process, um, Tyrell can jump into some of that as well. Um, so climate resilience, I just wanted to touch on this because uh, for the, uh, there's a lot of different components which I won't go into explicitly, but um, Logan Callan was uh, at study session a couple weeks ago and kind of shared more about the greenhouse gas emissions work that the city's been doing. And um, this particular grant that we got from Commerce and the planning effort that we're going to be undertaking will focus on greenhouse gas emissions, but the, the primary focus will be on climate resilience and kind of engaging the community on how people are experiencing impacts um, and how we can uh, plan for responding to and preparing for impacts. So uh, there's kind of a couple concepts within this realm. Um, we have mitigation, which is how can we mitigate from emissions, um, whether that's uh, from vehicles or buildings or, um, I say I have two sustainable trips twice. We do really want sustainable <laughs> trips. Um, renewable energy. And then adaptation is how, again, we're preparing and responding to those um, and managing our risk uh, for current and future hazards. So those all come together hopefully for uh, policies that really will help support a resilient community going forward. Uh, so within this, we have scoped out um, kind of a multi-phase planning process. We have uh, $700,000 from the Department of Commerce that is funded through the Climate Commitment Act. And for phase one, we have scoped out, um, and that's what the contract uh, that is up for approval with our um, consultant team, but we scoped out about $420,000. We did accept those grant funds back in February from council. So this process is kind of coming back and establishing the SBO uh, for those funds and then kicking off this process as well. Um, so that's gonna be over this year and through 2025, we um, get the funds on the state biennium. Uh, so that's kind of what those years are specifying. And then phase two, or I should say, so phase one, we'll be looking at climate impacts and hazards, um, policy audit, gap analysis, and then we'll dive more into risk and vulnerability. Phase two, we'll be looking at goals and policies, kind of taking all that information, identifying what goals and policies we, uh, we need, either new or revising what is in the comprehensive plan. 
Um, I mentioned environmental justice analysis, and then figuring out how, how all that will fit together within the comprehensive plan itself. And then um, we have, we're holding back some funds. Um, the, the grant itself is $700,000, and that can be used through 2029. So we're holding back some for implementation uh, after we have the comprehensive plan done and adopted, if there's any high priority climate planning tasks that we want to move forward in implementation, that'll give us a little bit of a buffer for that. Um, so for phase one, our, our primary consultant is Burke, uh, but we do have a pretty robust team. Uh, that includes Cascadia Consulting Group uh, that's going to be doing a lot of the um, the climate risk and vulnerability work. Uh, we have Kaufman and Associates Incorporated that will specifically be working with us on tribal engagement. Uh, Fair and Peers and Parametrics will be doing transportation, utilities, natural environment. Uh, so we have a pretty robust team and we're excited to get underway in working with them. Um, so that's the, the contract that we have uh, under consent. And um, as I mentioned, the kind of project startup um, doing the high-level analysis and then getting underway with our vulnerability and risk assessment. I won't go into this in too much because I know you all are wanting to get through the agenda and we can have more time on this, but generally we look at what are the hazards that the city is facing specifically uh, related to climate, uh, and then we look at the vulnerabilities that, um, you know, assets in the community, whether it's social, economic, environmental, community assets, what the levels of vulnerability, high, medium, low kind of ranking uh, per each of those hazards. And then that together identifies the risk, so the probability of something happening and then the level of impact that it would um, cause to whatever we're talking about, whether it's housing, um, ecosystem, uh, you know, health, health, uh, public health. Um, so it's, we, have, we can get into this in more detail in future future sessions, but this will be a really big part of phase one and the work that we're doing going forward. Oh, and of course, community experiences, um, rolling in climate justice and climate equity so that we are building this around um, what we're hearing from the community as well. Um, from that, uh, a really big part of this is climate justice, environmental justice that I mentioned. We know that not all climate impacts are equal or distributed equally. So this is really looking at a lens that allows us to understand the various ways that people are impacted um, and, um, and then considering the people that are impacted first and uh, the most and trying to bring that into our analysis so that we are, um, again, not worsening uh, impacts of inequities that exist or creating inequities into the future. So uh, we also have a public participation plan within the, um, all the materials that we submitted and um, some high-level engagement values and principles within there. Um, our consultant will be pulling together a much deeper engagement strategy with activities and timelines and all of that, but we at least wanted to um, share kind of some high-level direction. And a few things to consider is that We'll have an internal technical committee to work with uh, all of the city departments. We'll have an external kind of community partner committee that will um, meet at various points to kind of help guide the conversation. Uh, we'll also be working with our consultant team on tribal engagement specifically, and then have a bunch of ideas around general community engagement. So um, the, the public participation plan is in the materials, and then again, a deeper strategy will be coming. And uh, just a reminder, there's the comprehensive plan. If you haven't looked at it recently or if you have, there's a lot of chapters in there. And so we're going to be looking at how climate interacts with all of those chapters and, um, and working with our consultant to figure out how best to communicate that and integrate it into the comp plan. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, which is kind of um, adjacent to this, but... Another bill that was passed recently, uh, well, in the last legislative session, House Bill 1220, um, there's two parts. One is about housing, um, uh, uh, housing, what is the other one? Yeah, um, housing uh, qual quantity, I think. Uh, and then the other part 
is the racially disparate impacts. And so that is inter, uh, engaging with climate and climate justice and just that, um, the trying to lessen the impacts of, um, of climate and recognizing the, uh, the various ways that climate might impact housing security, um, housing stability, housing affordability. And um, so we're not specifically going to be, uh, there, there are specific things within here that we want to tie into climate planning, but the bill, the funding itself is for climate planning, but we do want to just be adjacent and align with this work so that we are um, integrating the conversation as much as possible. Um, so coming up, um, again, you accepted the climate planning funds in February, so that's already done. And then we have our resolution and our consultant contract, which um, unplanned, but a nice coincidence, will be coming forward on Earth Day, um, April 22nd, for you all. So um, that's kind of cool. And then we'll be hopefully uh, have another study session with you all to dive into more um, concepts and ideas as we get underway. Um, and then in May, we're looking at doing some community tabling, community outreach in alignment with the expo events, trying to take advantage of that, and then um, work with uh, you all to get some more time in June. So we have our um, consultants on board and have them available for you all to meet and engage with as well. So that is the climate planning item. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I think, and you finally kind of mentioned it at the end, uh, affordability is certainly the biggest concern I have with this whole thing. And I think the greatest injustice that could happen would be if we see a, an increase in cost of living as a result of this section being added to our comp plan. Um, so I guess my question is, in that Venn diagram at the very, very beginning, you laid out all the different components of this, but it, nowhere in there was the word affordability uh, or cost of living or anything related to that. And so is there perhaps the ability to add that as one of the key pieces of the planning um, process is that everything has to be viewed through the lens of affordability. Um, yeah, we'll dive into um, housing in kind of all of its forms as we get into the climate risk and vulnerability assessment. And so we can look at um, housing affordability and um, it, in that. Because obviously the, the basis of this entire thing is at conflict with the idea of affordability, barring new technologies that just reduces the cost, which could, could be out there and be in research, I don't know. But I, I think that that's got to be a key piece because right now, I mean, folks are struggling already as it is. And then you add another component of, well, now you need to use these super expensive materials so that you can, you know, increase your, you know, carbon reduction by 1% more. And, and what is the value of that reduction of 1% in the grand scheme of the city of Spokane? Um, I think we need to be able to get those data, data points as well. Sure. Yeah. And I know you've brought that up before. Yes. And so I think... Once we have our consultant on board, I think that'd be a great question to bring up one more time and we can get yes. their expertise on it too. That'd be great. Any others on this item? All right. Okay, thank you. Um, so I really quickly wanted to talk about Community Connectors and the grant that we have um, through Smart Growth America. Um, so Community Connectors is a really unique opportunity um, to uh, support leaders in small and mid-sized communities, both um, in and out of government, so government plus community partners, to help repair the damage of divisive infrastructure. And um, this, the city of Spokane uh, and the partners that we were working with um, were one of 15 uh, cities to be selected across the nation for this grant. It's uh, by Smart Growth America, America Walks, Equitable Cities, and New Urban Mobility Alliance. So it's not a, a federal grant, not a state grant, but um, a conglomeration of nonprofits that have come together to help fund, help fund this. Um, so this is the map of cities across the country. Um, Spokane's one of, one of 15 um, and the only one in the Northwest. Uh, so it's a really unique opportunity, and uh, we've been provided some funds to... Uh, for capacity building specifically, as well as access to technical, uh, technical assistance through these nonprofits and the work that they do. Um, so the focus for this is reconnecting the Fifth Avenue community. And um, again, as I mentioned, bringing together community and government partners 
to address the historical and ongoing harms of the divisive infrastructure, which for this community has been the highways, uh, both I-90 as well as the ongoing impacts from um, US-395. And uh, we have the $130,000 grant, again, specifically for capacity building. Um, and that term is pretty broad right now, so we're working with Smart Growth America to develop a scope and identify how we want to utilize those funds. Um, primarily, we want to be engaging the community-based organizations and community leaders in these conversations. Um, and then uh, we also have access to technical assistance uh, that can activate different consultants or do different studies or um, kind of help the community identify a, the problem and then uh, help identify the solution going forward. Um, so the, in the, the packet itself, um, there's the uh, SBO for the award, and then within the, um, connected to that under the consent items, there is the award letter from Smart Growth America, which also does include um, a high-level scope. So there's some more details there. And then we had submitted a resolution uh, to, um, for the council to consider to participate in the Community Connectors Program. The city will be the recipient of the funds though the funds are for the community, and so we just wanted to specify what the program is and how uh, the city can support that, and a little bit about the history of planning in this area um, connected to like the Fifth Avenue Initiative previously. Um, so that uh, was submitted, and then uh, we had to resubmit some materials, so I think I just saw Jacoby sent an email um, about that, but that is also up for consideration as well. Martin, the the Fifth Avenue uh, project, um, so I guess I'm just trying to understand. So is the, is the goal of this to, to actually build infrastructure that, that kind of crosses 90? Because we've, we've talked about capping 90, putting a mm -hmm. park there that would connect the two sides. Uh, obviously, you're not going to do that for $130,000, but is that the goal, is to, to get that over the finish line? Um, that is a large, larger vision. So what this... Uh, why this is geared specifically towards kind of the mid, small and mid-sized communities was that when communities of these size, I think it was between 50,000 and 500,000, when they were going to compete for federal funds through like the larger reconnecting communities um, federal funding, um, it just, was just not competitive uh, when you compare it to New York, LA, Chicago, really large cities. So this is a program, again, outside of government uh, but the nonprofits saw a need to try to support um, communities as they're developing ideas. So one of the technical assistants is possibly helping identify funding sources or preparing an application for uh, like a reconnecting communities grant in the future. Um, but recognizing that that can be a struggle for communities that have limited capacity. So that's what the funding now is going towards, is helping build capacity, but the ultimate connection is to um, be competitive in some of those larger grants. So we could use those dollars to, say, contract with, with a consultancy who's got really good grant writers or has good connections in D.C. to help bring in dollars? Is that the idea? Um, the idea, uh, that is um, an uh, allowed use of it. Uh, what we've put forward at the scope right now is to... Um, provide community compensation to lessen the burden of engagement and hopefully um, what, create... What does that mean, community compensation? Who are we compensating? Uh, the community-based oh, organizations. Who, who, who are those organizations? Um, well, we haven't fully scoped it out, but we've been working with um, ones along Fifth Avenue, so Carl Maxey Center, um, ideally the Martin Luther King Jr. Center, um, but it's specifically to engage on the Fifth Avenue project itself, correct. not yes. just for their own operating costs or anything like correct. that. Correct. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we, so the, the grant is fairly open, but that's what we've heard from the community is that everybody's doing it volunteer or as an add-on, and so trying to um, help leverage that this these funds to support their work and uh, tied specifically to this. Well, I would yes. just say, it seems like if the biggest issue is, is capacity, then we should put the money where we're gonna gain the most capacity, and that might be hiring somebody who can actually get us access to that capacity. All right, Council President. So, so thank you, and thank you, Martin, for that, and thank you, Councilmember McCart. That is a potential for that. This is specifically for the, what we're calling the Fifth Avenue Corridor, 
to support the Fifth Avenue Initiative, which came on almost four years ago. This money will support those nonprofits and volunteers who've been doing this work. We don't have a structure. We don't have a PDA. Um, it's been all volunteer. How do we bring it together, that community engagement, and how to help with that next visioning process, which is in parallel to the sub area planning that will be going on in the East Central neighborhood and how we go forward. So it's a sub area planning. It's a project with STA. We have washed out down there. We have a land bridge going on all south of the freeway and how we can bring that together is this grant. Also to help the community actually vision what could happen. So they will be able to do renderings for us. I, my analogy is how many of you remember the sign Spokane Valley Mall coming soon? Uh, that was years ago. The sign almost fell down before the valley came. But we need to actually give the East Central something to vision with and to get these organizations to help support them in one more thing that they are doing in the community outside of their original mission. So that's where we come for the financial support as to help with that structure as well, along with technical assistance, mm -hmm. which is not part of the 130000 which could be more additional resources to come forward. So the Correct. neighborhood is excited about that. Yeah. And so... Back to your point, we can access um, through Smart Growth America grant writers through, um, you know, to help us consider all of those options. And um, it's really, uh, right now we're just trying to get to pave the way so that we can accept the funds and get the work going um, so that we can lessen that, or build the capacity as we're doing it. Okay. And you still got one more, right? I got one more what? Was that the last thing you have to talk about? Oh, uh, yeah. that was it. Oh, wait. Yeah, that was it. Wait, right, you don't need to talk about this. I one. don't need to talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we Just can save that. it for another one. Okay. All right. Well, then, great. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, we got the, where we the rental registry update with Jason and Luis, too. Good afternoon, members of the council. I just really wanted to, to jump out ahead of, uh, of Jason just to first and foremost congratulate him on just the amount of work that's gone into this program, uh, the code enforcement elements of it, because I know that it, there's multi, multiple components to the, to the program. And it was a big, it was a massive lift. And so Jason, along with the, the, the greater uh, code enforcement department, really did uh, put a lot of work into this, working with um, multiple departments, uh, uh, multiple stakeholders. We've had uh, outreach and engagement. So uh, just a congratulations to him, and he'll be uh, going through a, uh, a presentation here to kind of show you where, where we're at and, uh, and still um, answer any questions about what's outstanding. Thanks, Luis. Good afternoon. Uh, just a quick presentation here. We'll answer any questions you might have. Again, this is really specific to code enforcement updates that we have. Uh, let's push the right button. Oh, figured it out. Okay, so just a quick recap. Uh, this ordinance did a lot of things. You all were involved in that process. It was a very lengthy process. For the code enforcement side of the house, uh, it established a long-term rental registry, and it gave us some capacity to do some uh, additional inspections. There's a lot of other issues in there. Uh, we'll touch on those briefly as well. Uh, this is meant as a community presentation, so there's some links in case uh, different members of the community want to go explore further. The application process for a rental property <clears throat> Uh, is essentially a two-step process. It's to obtain a business license and then to register the property through our uh, permitting software. So we integrated it into the way we do business on a variety of other subjects uh, in the Development Services Center, Fire Department, Code Enforcement. Various departments use this software system. So we built it internal to where if there are future changes to that software system, it just migrates uh, to the new system. <clears throat> Any property registry is really a data gathering effort. Uh, it helps us find out who to contact uh, should issues arise. It also helps us fac facilitate being at the properties more. Some, we'll call this preliminary data. Uh, as of 
April 1st, so we launched the registry on December 1st of 2023. Thus far, this is completely based on voluntary compliance response from our outreach. This includes a lot of email notices to specific landlords that we know, a lot of responses to complaints, a lot of phone calls and emails. Thus far, we have over 3,700 total rental properties registered, representing uh, close to 18,000 total units. Uh, there's a unit type breakdown there. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone here. Most of our rental units are at apartments, but most of our rental properties are single family homes. The average date of construction uh, per the registry data is 1950. So estimate that any rental unit you see is 75 years old on average. And then there's a breakdown of rental units by district there. Not an interactive map, I'm not a graphic designer. There will be some forward-facing mapping system in the future. This is just to demonstrate how many of these places there are. Each one of those pins represents uh, work that has been accomplished and more work that's needed to be done. Uh, so coming up to 4,000 pins there on the map, at some point in the future, this will be a GIS layer where people can see where all the different uh, properties are, uh, some sort of public-facing layer. When we do an inspection, so the registry gets us to the property and it lets us know who to contact if something uh, were to be needed at that property. When we get to a property, uh, we follow a very standard code enforcement inspection procedure. Uh, we focus on legal access, voluntary compliance, providing notification if there's an issue observed, and working with all the parties to try and find some sort of resolution. If that resolution isn't possible, we escalate uh, to potential civil infractions, building official hearings, et cetera. What we inspect for is a common question, uh, something we've spent a lot of time uh, speaking about in public meetings. There's a lot of fear about the things that we inspect for. We inspect on a maintenance basis, not on a new construction basis. So we don't inspect for the best and brightest of all technology to be present in a rental home. We just expect for, inspect for whatever's there to be maintained and safe. This is our existing substandard building deficiency list. These are very broad, generic categories uh, that we inspect. We have a more detailed checklist that we created as an educational resource to give people a little bit more detail as far as what these broad categories mean. And here's a few photos that I'll just show for a moment to show that we're not trying to be picky here. These are serious deficiencies of properties we're not inspecting for one bug or one mice, uh, mice. We're inspecting for infestations, deteriorations of buildings, cardboard and windows, boarded up windows, boarded up doors, massive plumbing problems and heating deficiencies where unsafe alternatives begin to be uh, used due to the deficiency, <clears throat> et cetera. So we are... Um, moving through what we call the review phases of these registry applications. That's making sure that each application is relatively complete, that they have a UBI number for their business license, which was a part of the ordinance. Uh, we have over a thousand applications that are completed and ready for inspection. So those inspections will start to be coordinated as we move forward. We'll continue to attend meetings, talk about the program, talk about inspections that we do. Um, and we are working on hiring as well for the additional positions that were um, discussed in the ordinance. Any questions? Hey. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the effort that you've put into it. Um, I know that uh, early on in the process, we had a lot of people reaching out to us like, hey, we're trying to comply, but the website is having some issues. Have we worked through um, a lot of those? Yeah. Yeah, we're not aware of any current issues, um, really any issues in a long time. Some of the challenges were like, we decided, a U here's an example would be, we were uh, decided a UBI number would be a required field. Right, so when they submit the application, you have to put in the UBI number or else it doesn't go through. Quickly we realized Department of Revenue was having massive delays with actually getting a business license. So we decided, okay, let's pull that required field back because we want the application to come in and we can backfill the UBI number. So we did 
have a few very minor tech problems. Most of the problems weren't really problems, it was just other delays that we accommodated uh, to the best of our ability. So with this business license, has a direct fund been established through code enforcement uh, for these resources to promote the overall safety and stability of housing? And do we have any idea what amount that is currently? The fund? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, the fund has been established. Uh, we met with accounting on that a while ago. Um, I don't have a specific number of what's in that fund currently, but I can get that back to you. And when it comes to the uh, amount of units, so I think a number I heard was something over 40,000 rental units, and we're at 17. Um, do we still have a high volume of um, people self-reporting? And, and then what's our plan if, you know, we realize we're still 20,000 units short. How do we, uh, you know, find and, and, and get that done? Yeah, we, we heard that number too, 40,000. Um, we'll feel better about our number towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll compare and contrast from there. Uh, we do have anecdotal stories from, uh, I talked to a property management company representative today that said they were working out an issue with DOR and they have 1,500 units to register. Uh, we also have, I was here a couple months ago for our foreclosure registry software. A piece of that software helps us identify rental properties, so we'll do some identification and more proactive noticing to those uh, owners as well. Is the, the tenant fee being collected? Do we know? $15 per unit fee? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a, that's a part of our application process. Uh, I'll do a quick caveat to say there is a piece of the ordinance about a waiver, a per unit fee waiver. Um, as that's being developed, we do have an option for that fee to be essentially invoiced, to stay in an invoice layer so they don't have to pay it yet. Uh, and then if they do qualify for that waiver, that, that fee would be waived. But yes, all, all fees are being paid. And, and who, who is that being, like, who's the target audience for that? Is it the landlord or is it the tenant? Because the intent of the legislation was that it's the tenant. The, do you mean the $15 Correct. fee waiver? Um, no, the fifth, just the $15 fee. It's, it's a fee on the tenant, not on the landlord. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, Luis might want to jump in, but... No. Yeah, sorry. So, so the fee is actually being uh, paid at the time of registration. So the registration is specifically to the landlords or uh, uh, agents with the understanding that that was going to be a pass-through. So that was in conversation that was happening, saying, you know, this is just going to be added to, to the rent. We kind of divvied that up, $15, you know, uh, divided by 12. That's not a lot of, of, of monies type thing, but that is a, a cost that's being um, bared by the landlord assumed to be passed on. But in the, in the description online when they go to, to do all this, does it say this is a fee on your tenant that you are now paying and making it clear that this is not a fee on the landlord? Uh, no. So, so again, the, the ordinance wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, specified down to that level. It was saying that part of being read, uh, having the privilege to rent your property within the corporate limits was going to be a per-door fee. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, this is a registration for the landlords and or uh, property management, so it's just going to be paid yeah. by the landlords. Un unfortunately, it was in the recitals, but it's there. I mean, yeah. it's, it's in there. So. Yeah, I think I'm just going to add to that same thing. With any other fee, it's however the person is paying the fee decides to pass it on. But. Correct, but we could send the invoice to the unit. All right, um, anybody else have any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Very informative and um, I know, very timely, I just had some people last week reaching out asking, what's this all about? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I was there when we passed it, you're welcome. <laughs> so thank you very much for that update. Uh, next we have the update on the Spoken Human Rights uh, commission's uh, homelessness resolution sent to council, and Councilmember Navarrete is going to uh, brief us on that. Thank you, um, Council President. As the Council liaison to the Spokane Human Rights Commission, I uh, would like to read a resolution that passed into the record. Whereas the city of Spokane knows the issue of homelessness is one of the most pressing and complex situations encountered by our society in developing public policy to be established on this matter, whether short term or immediate, emphasis should be given to attending to the basic needs of the homeless to enable the preservation of the dignity of these human beings in their circumstances 
and whereas the city of Spokane should reassert its constitutional commitment to hold that all people are equal before the law and that there must be no discrimination whatsoever on the basis of protected status as recognized in state and federal law and in municipal code. It is also um, uh, reveal attitudes of insensitivity, contempt, harshness, shunning, and fear towards those experiencing homelessness, and whereas respect for the dignity of human beings and equality before the law are principles which are fundamental and non-expendable to guarantee the common good and healthy um, community living as people, people experiencing homelessness are a direct reflection um, and the most dramatic outcome of the complexities of our society. These are human beings of various ages and with diverse levels of education and backgrounds with unmet basic needs, with human rights, which are frequently in French, who also have talents and dreams, and who have inner and outer strengths from which hope is forged. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Spokane Human Rights Commission hereby requests that the City um, Council of the City of Spokane create a framework of protections to address shelter inadequacies and operations in city limits and add protections in the municipal code for our society's most vulnerable population. An example of this policy would be as follows. No person's rights, privileges, or access to public services and accommodations may be denied or ab abridged solely because they are experiencing homelessness. Such a person shall be granted the same rights, privileges, and responsibilities as any other resident of the city of Spokane. A person experiencing homelessness has the right to use and move freely in public spaces, including but not limited to public sidewalks, public parks, public transportation, and public buildings in the same manner as any other person, and without discrimination on the basis of their housing status. All individuals should be subject to the same rules and regulations expected of any other person. They have the right to equal treatment by all municipal agencies without discrimination on the basis of housing status. Has the, they have the right not to face discrimination while seeking or maintaining employment in the city of Spokane due to their lack of permanent mailing address or their mailing address being that of a shelter or social service provider. Has the right to emergency medical and psychiatric care free from discrimination based on their housing status and has the right to receive documentation necessary to prove identity from voting without discrimination due to their housing status, has the right to protection from disclosure of their records and information provided to homeless shelters and service providers to federal, state, municipal, and private entities without appropriate legal authority, and the right to confidentiality of personal records and information in accordance with all limitations on disclosure established by local, state, and federal law and has the right to a reasonable expectation of privacy in their personal property to the same extent as personal property in a permanent residence. And finally, I want to thank the Human Rights Commission as well as the Civic um, Impact Committee for their great work in drafting and pushing this resolution through. I also want to acknowledge that this is the first draft and that we'll be working hard to refine the resolution so that it's, it's effective as possible while maintaining its original intent, uh, which is to uphold the rights and dignity of people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. And as the council liaison to the Human Rights Commission, I would like to request that we follow this resolution up with council action. Anybody commentary on that? Well, I'm just curious. So they passed a first draft, but they're going to pass new versions of this going forward. So which version do they want us to adopt? Uh, we are still working on that one. Um, this is just a, a first draft um, that they worked on, and we're working with um, City Legal to, to make it um, better. Well, I guess why are we reading it if they haven't finished it yet? But, so, so Council Member Cathcart, they did bring this forward last year, I believe, right, the end of the year, with some transitions in leadership and uh, people who oversaw those committees. 
I'm just going to do my community assembly report right now to follow up on that. And thank you, Council Member Navarati. So Council has been receiving a number of resolutions from boards and commissions and neighborhood councils. Uh, Council Member Navarati, Bingle and Catcart are helping us to actually develop a process of how we deal with resolutions from our community members. So that'll be going forward. There is a rough draft of it'll come through that committee. It will, we're working with our policy director right now on this, that it'll come in. Um, the council member who is the liaison to whatever that board commission or neighborhood council will bring it forward. It will be kicked over to council president and a work group uh, at this point in time. Whatever the appropriate initiative manager is, this one obviously is housing. So we'll be working on that. And they'll be looking at to see if there's something we can do, if there's an ordinance we could write, or if we do our own resolution. But the outcome is that we will be responding to these resolutions in some shape, form, or fashion, and they don't come into council and just go into a black hole, never to be seen again. So they will be acknowledged and they will be responded to. And if there's something legal we could do uh, in, the, in the interim, then we'll be looking at that as well. So. Well, I, I, yeah, and I get that. I have no issues with it at all. I just wondered if it's a first draft, presumably they're going to make changes, specific changes, requests. I, I just assume there's going to be some differences. So I just would think Can we'd wait. Yeah. Clarity. Um, so actually, it's not a first draft. It's a resolution they passed in October of last right. year. And so it's not a draft. It's their final resolution. And then I think that the draft piece is that if we do anything with it, there would be a draft or something like that. Oh, okay. But to be okay. clear, gotcha. they right. passed it. Right. Gotcha. Okay. That, that makes right. that, that clarifies. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Never. Any other comment about that? Yes, Councilman. Yeah. Did you say I was helping with that? I thought you were in that committee. No, it's me. Oh, it's you. Okay, I was like, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any recollection of this. It's the council operations committee. Yeah. Okay. If you're not here, I'll just assign you to something. <laughs> so that's kind of how that works. But, but there is a working group to address this, and that came up at community assembly loud and clear. It's like, we're speaking to you, and you're not speaking back. So we'll be moving yeah. forward with that. Yeah, I think part of that was whether that means that we'll have a draft of a resolution or an ordinance to work on, or if it will just be a response back. Uh, Absolutely. Whether it's a, yeah, thank you for letting us know, sort of thing. Um, all right, any other questions, comments? All right, then we'll go on to the next one, which is the ordinance relating to residential rent rental properties. Uh, Council Member Dillon. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so this uh, ordinance is pretty cut and dry. Uh, it's expanding the, um, Increased period for uh, a rental increase right now where we are at the state minimum um, of 60 days. We've seen some other cities expand their notification requirement. Kind of the big origins of this ordinance, there was a, a bill that moved forward uh, this legislative session through different committees. It did pass uh, the House. Uh, it was House Bill 2114, and it did... Uh, a lot of different things in its proposal, including uh, limitations on rent and uh, fee increases, um, tenant lease termination provisions, move-in fees, security deposits, um, kind of worked with Attorney General on opening a, a new office that would be a resource center for both uh, tenants and landlords. Um, but really, um, through that, there was the um, language around the um, fee increase notice requirements. And so um, because this was, you know, kind of uh, debated, there was a lot of engagement around this legislative session passed a month ago. It seemed uh, fitting to go ahead and, and pull this um, into our municipal code. Uh, we know that when Spokane leads, the rest of the state um, does follow. Um, and to be clear, um, this uh, state bill was uh, rent stabilization. Uh, this ordinance is not that. Um, definitely heard some commentary and feedback around that, so just want to clarify that, that this is not that. There's a 1981 state law that preempts uh, cities from being able to um, regulate uh, rent in that fashion. Um, and you know, we know um, from the data from multiple media reports, um, how the number of evictions has 
uh, significantly increased, um, how many renters are cost burdened uh, in the city, um, spending more than 30% uh, of their income uh, on rent. And so uh, I really do believe that if we are going to address uh, homelessness, um, that this is uh, a really important way to do that. Um, it does give folks ample time uh, to find a new place to live, which is really critical um, when they do uh, see their rent increase and it comes to a point uh, where they can't afford it. And so I think uh, a lot of the discussions that I've had with uh, landlords and tenants, there really is a uh, you know common goal of keeping people in their homes. And I think that this is... Uh, a step to do that, and there's uh, definitely a lot of precedence for this discussion um, with what we've seen with, at the state level. Well, yeah, I would just, I, I, I appreciate you bringing this forward and the conversation on it. Um, and on, on the surface, it sounds really good, obviously. More time is, is really good, but I think that there's obviously some really serious unintended consequences that can come. One, when you have 60 days, you're able to be, I think, more reflective of what the current market conditions are rather than trying to guess. And I think you overguess because you have to, because you can't fix it if you screw up. So you're going to guess high. Second, we've got inflation. Um, we just talked about another uh, property tax increase of a dollar per thousand. That would be coming up in three months, something that landlords would not have been able to account for. Um, and that could be two to $500 a year on, on these homes that we're talking about. So that's a substantial increase that could affect the landlord's ability to even provide basic maintenance and, and upkeeping, which has been an ongoing issue that we've had in the city of Spokane. So I, I think the detrimental side of this is pretty significant. Um, and, and I think that, you know, again, it sounds great on paper. Yes, I want six months to plan, but I think the true kind of outcomes and unintended consequences are, are just severe enough that, um, you know, I just don't think it's the right policy direction, but that's just my thought. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. Um, definitely hear you on the concerns around uh, property tax increase that did come up with some of the landlords I spoke to. And, and there are a lot, a lot of landlords that do, uh, you know, wait until someone else moves in or um, kind of plan ahead with a lot of those maintenance costs. Um, we definitely you know, always want to be uh, cautious of a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, but, uh, yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you. So, Councilmember Dillon, is there a city that's currently at 180 days in the state of Washington? Yeah, Seattle was the only one that I could currently find. Um, still looking at some of the other cities, Tacoma, Bellingham, they're at about 120 days. Um, one other thing that came out about this, too, is... Uh, reinforcing the need for rental assistance. Uh, that was something that uh, Bellingham did implement and something that I think um, our next kind of uh, discussion uh, with the state legislative agenda and how this dovetails to um, some of these uh, changes really does reinforce the need for that supplemental component. Right, right. I, and I certainly agree that, you know, 60 days is not adequate. I just had a personal experience with an employee, walked in crying. She has 60 days to find somewhere else to live, and she can't do it. But I also heard that most of our rental properties were built in 1950. And so, you know, the ongoing maintenance of older properties is also a challenge when we're looking at. It just takes one something, a new hot water tank, or something to really impact a small landlord. Uh, big, big ones can, can probably weather the storm, but it's the small ones who have one property or two properties. Uh, that would be my concern on, on the length of time, but certainly open to further discussion on that. Okay. Anybody? Our last one, and then we got to move on. Yeah, I guess the question would be, are you set on 180 days, or is there some movement in there where we could match Tacoma or somebody else and be at 120 or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty set on it. Um, because it does, I think, parallel to some of the movement that we did see um, at the state. I mean, I think that is the direction that we, we are going. And so I think lining it up uh, seemed fitting. That's why I went with that number. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next is the resolution appointing members of the Housing Action Subcommittee. Nicolette, if you can do that quickly. We're running a little behind on time. 
I also just uh, sent Jacoby a chart of all the other cities in the state of Washington and how long they have uh, for those notice of rent increase, and so I can send that out to you guys later today. Okay, so um, being that we're pretty short on time, um, nothing has changed the last time I, I briefed you guys about this. Um, it's just appointing new members of the Housing Action Subcommittee. Um, the only uh, possible things I could foresee happening are folks who may want to uh, take themselves off, because I did receive an email uh, a few minutes ago from Paul Kropp wanting to be removed. And so um, I would have to substitute that, and I'll make sure to go through Jacoby to do that in the proper process. Are there any questions about, about this? Pretty straightforward. Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks, Nicolette. Super quick. All right, next we'll do Don for your two items, the shelter audit and the fair housing. And we'll do that till about three, is that okay? And then at three we'll do our council reports to hopefully be done, 3.05, 3.05-ish. Three, oh five. Three, oh five Jacoby, we're gonna have Sarah go first on the shelter audit. I think those slide, the presentation should be in the urban experience. So I don't know, Council, if all of you have met Sarah in person yet, but this is Sarah Clement Sampson who's been working with us to lead this process. So she's going to walk through the slides, and I'm here to help, help answer questions, but she's the, the current expert on what's been going on. Ooh, big words there. <laughs> expert on this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for letting me um, with this process. And so, yes, we've been conducting an emergency shelter audit. And this has been the process. So we engaged with internal departments. There are about six city departments that we engaged with, toured um, and met with about eight agencies that are currently operating shelters that are funded by the city, and uh, a couple, one that is not, or a few that are not. And then we also engaged some additional partners that just have um, information and are engaged with the homeless uh, community and the shelter population, like Downtown Spokane Partnership, Aging and Long-Term Care of Eastern Washington, and then was actually able to engage with a few of the homeless people who are not in, interacting with our shelters. Um, so then we had the emergency shelter provider engagement. We did a report out to the community, um, which a lot of this presentation will be a lot of what that was with some additional kind of our findings at the end of that. Uh, we also had some neighborhood outreach through surveys through both the neighborhood council and direct. And then this is our um, outreach to all of you and the mayor. So just to have kind of a common understanding of the complexity of this process and all the ways that people can enter and exit into the homeless, um, homeless services and that continuum of housing. These uh, numbers are from our CMIS system um, with what's currently being provided within our community. So these are these next ones I'll go through rather quickly just because I know you are short on time. Um, but these are basically the definitions. And so um, there's a lot of words on here that are the actual HUD definitions with some examples, not all inclusive of all the programs that are provided in the community, but just some of the programs that are provided in the community. But diversion is basically having a person potentially experiencing homelessness, what are the resources that they can provide themselves? What are some of the things that they can be self-empowered to, um, to divert out of homelessness? Homelessness prevention then comes in with some of the services, of typically rental assistance, something like that, to keep them housed. Then we have, and we broke up emergency shelter into kind of a night by night, and this is the typical kind of house of charity that you might think of, where someone would check in and they do need to check in each night at a certain time to be able to keep their bed. Oftentimes they have a bed assigned to them, but they do need to continually check in with that. But then we're also developing this kind of newer emergency shelter aspect that's an entry to exit. And this is more of kind of a, a wraparound service and you're kind of there a little bit longer. The way out shelter is a good example of this where you're kind of engaged with them and you are coming back and you can kind of go in and out but you are, you are engaged with there. They might have a curfew but you talk with them if they have a, you're working nights or something like that, you'd be able to come back to your bed and your space. And then rapid rehousing, you must be homeless to be able to get into rapid rehousing, but that's, as the language says, is trying to get you back into housing as quickly as possible. Transition shelter, this is, um, by HUD definition, it's no longer than two months. It's usually, it's a kind of decreasing model because there, there's usually some barriers that you're trying to overcome to be able to get into homelessness where they, HUD prefers the housing first model. And so then, it, getting all those requirements to potentially go into permanent supportive housing. Um, and this, this could be potentially what you stay in for your lifetime. You must have a disability to require to be able to access this, but it's housing with services. But then there's other kind of permanent housings, housing options. And 
some of it like just providing the housing, these are like the havens where there aren't necessarily services provided for it, but it's kind of those that are exiting out of homelessness, having some place for them to go. And then there could be some of those type of things, but they do provide services, but they don't have a disability requirement, so they aren't considered supportive housing. Then hopefully they can move into the voucher program, that's a subsidized housing, where they would go out into the market, be able to um, have a subsidized housing voucher um, and have a decreased amount of rent. And then hopefully we can get them to market rate where you know, they're out in the community, they're operating at, um, at a market rate and, uh, and engaging with their, their, our community housing system. This is just to kind of show the variance in programs that we have within our community is something that is very basic system services. The Jules program, she has everything donated to her. All she's paying for is one person per 20 people versus something like the Catalyst where there's a lot of people wrapping around services and all of that infrastructure that's needed to cover that. So there's a vast array when people say, how much are we spending on all this? There's a vast array of what's needed within this community and all of those ways to be able to address the individual needs of the person experiencing homelessness. So what we heard from the, the shelters and the providers is largely scattered site models work. They like to, in, it, smaller sites work because they can engage with people. We I even heard from the track shelter when they decreased to 250, it was a lot more uh, manageable just because they could build relationships. 24 seven is preferred because they can know where their people are. They know how to communicate with each other, call each other and know where to find someone. They like to see more aftercare and continuing care services so they know if someone comes back into homelessness, how do we find them? How do we re-engage them and get them back on track? We are seeing an aging population, both in chronic and newly homeless. Um, so those that have worked their entire life have social security are now experiencing homelessness and figuring out how to engage the system. There's more mental health needs. Um, that's exacerbated through su substance abuse issues and we don't really have any place to go. Where do we put people with um, high mental health needs? Collaboration and communication is essential. The, the organizations that work best is when they can focus on what they do well and partner with someone else who's doing what they do well, um, instead of kind of one organization trying to be all encompassing and covering all things. The organizations that have been really successful have great collaboration with landlords. There's also an increased cost burden to cover illnesses since COVID because of the additional health, health department requirements, and that's continuing to move forward with additional illnesses. And fentanyl is a game changer. It's just um, making everything worse. There's a much, in much more intense need for medical detox um, that they haven't necessarily seen before. And then anyone who might come off of this, um, it's like they have a traumatic brain injury when they recover from it. And so they need that continual, almost lifelong services afterwards. I wanted to break apart data just because data was very specifically mentioned in a lot of cases and so we're looking at those areas. Um, a lot of the people that are entering in the data into the CMIS system, they want to be able to see, they want to be tracked more on terms of not who they're getting housed but all the supports and services that they're providing to people because they could be re-engaging with people that are entering back into the system. And that aftercare support of continuing to stay with someone after they're housed and they're getting kind of dinged with that, with the, um, the monitoring system. or the, CMIS progress system already. Uh, some of the challenges they're seeing is, again, that monitoring recidivism of them coming back in. If they exit from a partner agency, they aren't necessarily able to see that. Uh, they're required to enter data, but they can't necessarily see the, the spectrum of that data, as you can see from recidivism or exits. Um, and then as time has gone on and new administrations and staff, there seems to be additional layers that have been of uh, barriers been put in place of signatures and papers and things like that and just trying to strip a lot of that away and get back to what is necessary to be able to access this data and then as a community they're saying to each other if they aren't entering the data there needs to be more accountability because as you saw before that was just the information entered into CMIS so it's useful for the entire community if people are entering this in. Some of the gaps in the system again medical detox um, that intensive medical care uh, especially with the aging population, um, there's more exacerbated medical needs, but then hospice care. A lot of these people are dealing with end-of-life services and no training, um, only so, uh, social work training along with that. There's no sex offender housing. Where do people that are sex offenders go in those exiting jail? Along with long-term beds and treatment detox. There's SPDAT score, so if you're um, 
actively homeless and using, you'll get a higher, higher score and get into housing first versus someone who's kind of been through treatment and trying to get clean and how can we kind of even that out a little bit so that they, once they get out of treatment, they have a place to go in that continued care. So from the com community conversations, um, it was very interesting. We had providers and partners, but a lot of them use very similar language. And the goal that they really brought forward for the emergency shelters is a safe point of access and connection to resources. This should be stabilizing where basic needs are met, showers, bathrooms, and it should be trauma-informed. And they would like to see a navigation to triage um, to appropriate placements. And so for future state, what they would like to see emergency shelters is focus on prevention and inclement weather, leverage, of course, the partners and resources and operate off of accurate and real-time information. As I mentioned, we did some, so this is from the neighborhood. It was a survey put out through the neighborhood councils. Uh, we got 103 responses. You can see the top three uh, neighborhood councils that participated. We offered up a centralized model or kind of a scattered site model and or other, and as you can see, um, majority said both. They like to see kind of a combination of all of that. Uh, biggest concerns, um, uh, other, but then increased crime and long-term housing. Th this kind of came up across all the surveys, but you know, there's definitely a split between, we don't need to reward bad behavior and there's basic human rights that we need to address. Um, so that's kind of the gamut across it all. There's definitely safety concerns and the level of staffing. And then in this one particular, they were interested in data and how to access the data that's seen in having success stories with how that looks. And contrast, contrasting to that, we had a community survey. So this was put out through the city channels, uh, social media, those types of things. We had 464 responses, 82% from the city of Spokane. Granted, it was sent out through the city's channel, so of course. But you can see the difference in the uh, neighborhoods that, the, that um, responded in the, to this one. And again, uh, their preference would be both having a scattered site and centralized uh, model. Their biggest concerns was getting people into long-term housing. And then along with their, their safety was a lot more mention about safety among women and, and women, uh, seniors and veterans, so that elderly care. And there was a lot more mention around tiny homes and parking lots and how to utilize those other efforts um, within their comments. So um, that's what we're working on right now is engaging with you and then we will have focused conversations uh, to create a more uh, final recommendation report to you with the existing shelters and, and on-site providers and follow up with you again in May with a recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. I have many. Um, all right. Well, thank you for this. I appreciate it. So I did a, just a rough count of the amount of beds you, you uh, laid out here for us. And it's like 5,500 beds. Um, and I think that that's pretty surprising, even to me, somebody being, uh, you know, in the business, if you will. 5,500 beds kind of surprised me a little bit. And I think if we went out and we talked to the uh, community and we shared the fact that we're talking about 5,500 beds in this system, I think they would also be shocked at how many beds there, are, there actually are. Um, so that's something I'd like to see us communicate to the public as they're coming because, uh, you know, we frequently hear that there's not enough. 5,500 blows my mind a little bit, honestly. Well, and you do have to consider, so a lot yeah. with a point in time count, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's everything that's being funded by the city. Mm -hmm. So that includes permanent supportive housing where someone right. might be in that for a very long time, right. in fact, their lifetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we're looking at the point in time count, it'd be better to kind of look at point in time count versus just the emergency shelter beds mm -hmm. um, and rapid rehousing and transitional right. shelter, maybe. Do you have any which thoughts is, on that? Which is well over 2,000 between yeah. that, right? Yep. So you got 300 for transitional, 13, you know, 1,700, 20, 2,400 beds there in, in, that, um, yep. in that grouping. Um, one of the other questions I have is when we were talking about, I know when we were originally starting with Jules Churches, it was $31 a night. But I thought that that number went up with the most recent six-month contract, that it's not 31 a night anymore. Am I wrong on that? No, I think it's still about that. There was that confusion when it switched from 60 to 80 beds, so we mm -hmm. made the contract adjustment. I can pull it back up, but it, sh it still should be in that 31 to $33 ballpark okay. range. Yeah, and the invoices have been tracking right along with projected expenses at that rate. Okay. Um, when it comes to the sex offender housing, how many do we have in the city of Spokane versus other cities in the, in, in the state? have to go research that. I, I think that that would also be a, a great thing for us to understand because I think that we would probably find ourselves in a higher number there than, than some of our, our other cities. Um, Council member, we're going to let other people have a chance to ask questions too. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. 
Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my understanding is we're, we're a drop-off point for McNeil Island, so we have quite a few. Uh, I, I guess my main question, and thank you, this is great information, uh, really good information actually, but my main question is kind of, I, and I talked about it, doing an audit back in December quite a bit, but really my intent was a financial audit, trying to understand what are we getting for the immense cost, uh, particularly at TRAC. And so is there some look at the financial side that will be reported back to council that we can get some better clues on that? Yeah, I mean, part of what the recommendations will look at is what is the city, like what, obviously the city is not funding all of this. And so of what the city is funding, what are those projects and, and types of beds? Um, a lot of this is not, is not city funded, right? Like UGM's men's shelter is counted in here. Um, but there will be some additional financial information. We are still working with track on their contract amendment. So we'll, you'll be getting an email from me later today or tomorrow with an update on that particular location. Um, but we can certainly add a financial review as part of the final recommendations. And that, that will happen in the context of what we recommend funding going forward with, okay. but we could also do a look back if that was of interest. Because I've, I've heard a lot, and it's not just tracks. So I don't want to single them out. It's, it's some others that we fund as well. Just, and it's a, it's a lot of anecdotal, but it's information around, you know, how many people are actually on staff at any given time? Are they actually on premises for the eight to 10 hours that their shift is or whatever that... It just, we're not, you know, I, we're not there day to day managing this yeah. stuff, and so we don't have those it, answers. Part, Part of what's tough about it, and I think there was one slide with the, that shows kind of the, the Jules model and the Catalyst model that makes this hard to compare. Right? Catalyst has on-site SUD professionals and mental health clinicians who certainly cost more than a, a shelter operational worker who's just kind of doing observing and passing out toiletries and that kind of thing. So it's because the models vary so much, the cost-by-cost -cost analysis is tough. We're getting closer to understanding that through this process, so it's certainly kind of part of, we know that we need some highly serviced models, and we know we can use some kind of lower serviced models, and that will all include some financial analysis with it. Okay. Yeah. Council member, yeah, thank you so much for this, and we kind of want to spend more time on this, actually, uh, but um, love, like to continue the discussion, and I guess, you know, where will this live? I mean, because I think to Council Member Bingle's point about just the number of beds, and I, you know, I was, that was surprising to me, um, and I think that, you know, this really will help inform a lot of our decisions and looking forward to more of the recommendations, but will the public be able to access this and the neighborhoods that took the surveys? The, the hope, and we, um, we've hired our HMIS program manager. She'll start next week, and we've got some contract support right now who's focusing on dashboards. So I think part of our big hope is to start with just getting this information onto dashboards so people can see it, and then over time work towards more modeling and projections so where we can use that data to actually model and project what we need going forward. Yeah. I just want to do a quick comment. Um, being in the business of residential housing, those numbers are up there. It doesn't mean all those bits are available. We even have long-term people who are in those beds. Mm -hmm. So you think you got that many that are available to turn over, you don't, mm -hmm. because they're already being occupied. So I think we really just need to keep that in the front of our mind. Really, the number and what's available is, can be extreme from the community yeah. perspective. Yeah, I mean, the vacancy rates in some of these projects are, you know, zero. So there is a, the ebb and flow is not what we'd want it to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then, uh, here in the community survey results, I see uh, you know a lot of uh, Browns Edition, Lincoln Heights, Audubon, Dowd River. Um, when we're when we're moving forward with this, um, as we take these responses in, um, I think it's important that when we're discussing these things, that uh, you know places where they do currently have an emergency shelter or something like that, that maybe I don't want to say that it's, it's weighted more heavily, but they're experiencing things that other people aren't. Because I see some neighborhoods in here, right? Um, and I could be wrong. Does Lincoln Heights have a shelter in Lincoln Heights? And I don't know they, if they do not, but they have a high number of uh, homeless people who are in their parks. Up there. Sure, very, and, very uh, active neighborhood council. Sure, yeah, and uh, you know Audubon Downriver. I don't know if there's a homeless shelter in in Audubon. Mm -hmm. There is. What is it? Transitions. Transitions. Okay. Yeah. And that's why I'm asking because I'm just. Well, and you saw. I mean, like yeah. Chief Gary had a, yeah. the highest response. Right. right. They've got Trent. So you're right. certainly seeing yep. the. Yep. Yeah. So. And, and really the intent of those is to try and figure out what are the themes we yeah, can totally. pull from this mm -hmm. to make long-term planning more successful. We know that neighborhoods are going to play a critical role, and there are certainly neighborhoods currently more impacted than others. Yeah. Um, and I am interested as we move forward, because I think that there are facilities in the area uh, that are um, things that could help us uh, uh, pair 
what our needs are with uh, with the needs of the, the group that we're trying to, with the population that we're trying to serve. Uh, some of those are state-owned and state-run facilities that would be really beneficial to the, to the city of Spokane. And so I'm hoping as we pursue those that the state would allow us to lean into some of those assets. Yeah, yeah and I think having, I know, Councilmember Dillon mentioned this, but we, we flew through this, so we're happy to come back and do yeah. further conversation or a study session because that kind of feedback is going to be helpful for us mm -hmm. as we roll out plans and know which partners to connect with. Yeah, yeah. And then you still had another presentation too. Yes, and Marley's yeah. very good at being fast. Okay, um, I was going to suggest that we bump back the council reports to briefing because there's not much on briefing, sure. so, and that we can still do this today. And thank you guys. We we are yeah. learning the on base process. So we got it into on pace and forgot the final review button. And alas, I am draining on with your session today. But this is Marley. Marley's been with the Northwest Fair Housing Alliance for I don't know, nearly two decades probably. Um, some of you probably know Marley, but we asked her to come in today and just do an overview on fair housing um, as we look at these recommendations and both how we use state and local resources, trying to make sure that council and the administration and my department in particular have a clear understanding of what fair housing does and doesn't mean. Um, and I will thank Marley and apologize that I'm forcing her to go so quick. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Don. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I do have a presentation, uh, it's 12 slides. I will try and fly through it really fast. Um, but uh, I was asked by the NHHS director to talk about how the Fair Housing Act intersects with the populations that are targeted by 1590 funds for developing affordable housing, and then also some things that are in the Spokane Municipal Code requiring a race equity framework in the prioritization and recommendations of the use of those funds. So I just wanted to look at the layers and, and, um, and yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So really, we're, we're looking at three things here. We had the, the RCW that allows local jurisdictions to um, assess, say, sales and use tax of one-tenth of one percent and use it to develop affordable housing, essentially. And then the city of Spokane adopted a municipal ordinance as well and then added some additional provisions, including the requirement to use a race equity framework in... Um, in using those funds, and then at the same time, you need to comply with the Fair Housing Act. And so I'll just kind of walk through what all these different layers are here. Um, do I have, I have the control here? Yeah, it's actually the black clicker. The black clicker. Um, oh, this yes. thing? Okay. Yeah. There. Okay, got it. And it's going to be the down arrow. Okay, all right. So these are the priorities, the, target, the targeted populations that come already in the RCW. These people, these populations need to be at 60% of median income, and then there's a variety of folks in here, veterans, homeless, people with disabilities that are already set by the RCW and then incorporated into the uh, municipal code. And then the municipal code for the city has adopted these additional funding priorities. So I'm not going to go through all these, but things like prioritizing permanent housing, mixed-use housing, housing near transportation, et cetera. Um, and then this is the addition in the Spokane Municipal Ordinance that requires employing a racial equity framework in um, utilizing these funds that are being collected. And then now this interacts with the Fair Housing Act because the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on these enumerated protected classes, including race, color, religion, national origin, et cetera. Um, you cannot single out a specific race or national origin um, in terms of which programs are going to be funded, who's going to get to live in the housing, and so on. So how do you employ the race equity lens um, and further race equity without violating the Fair Housing Act? Um, Race-conscious policies are typically prohibited in... Um, government programs. Um, we have some constitutional pro prohibitions. And again, the Fair Housing Act would prohibit singling out a specific population. Um, race conscious policies, you can have them, but they're subject to a much higher judicial scrutiny, strict scrutiny review. Um, whereas a race neutral policy is only subject to a the more lenient rational basis standard. And so many jurisdictions that are trying to advance race equity will look at race neutral metrics and try and target where people are showing up that are um, disproportionately impacted, um, whether it be by poverty, by income, um, uh, over participation in um, you know, public, publicly supported housing programs, um, things like that. And so 
Um, you know, we, there's tons and tons of data you can look at, but if you do start delving into the data, you can see in Spokane, we have people who are disproportionately impacted based on this one's poverty. Um, you can see the disparities here uh, by income. Uh, here we have all household, the annual, um, the annual median household income is about 63000 This was over the 2018-22 range. Um, but if you break it down by different races, um, you get down to Native American, Alaska Native, it's 35000 So, I mean, we have huge disparities in income. Got one more here. Um, when you're looking at the 60% AMI, area median income, in 2022 for everyone it was 69000 um, for 60% uh, of that, the slide's a little bit cut off, but that second row, 60% of the median household income is about 41,000. Looking at census data, um, they had a clean cutoff number of 40,000. You can look at the percentage of each race that is at less than 40,000 area median income. And you, so you can see by serving 60% AMI, you're going to be having a bigger impact. You're going to be reaching more potentially eligible people in non-white races. So, um, so data can show you a lot. Um, let's see, I'm going. So essentially, how do you then, additionally to, uh, um, besides targeting different populations based on where people are underrepresented um, or overrepresented, um, you look at things like who, how is our marketing, where are we advertising, are we using a diverse array of media to let people know about funding opportunities or programs they can apply for, are we offering technical assistance to small um, businesses, um, connecting them with services that may already be out there, technical assistance, um, are we, is our process accessible for people? So you look at, is it accessible for people to apply for the programs? And then you also want to look at the reporting, have some requirement, required mandatory reporting um, as to who's being served in the program so you can see are there disparities in who's getting housed and then what do you need to do to try and uh, address that later. So that was kind of a real fast <laughs> around the world. Um, but it, it all connects, so you have to do both. It's not mutually exclusive, um, but you can't single out a specific race or a protected class, but you can look at your overall systems and process, and by targeting people who are at 60% AMI, you're already going to be reaching a lot of impacted groups. So, yes. so I don't know if it changes in anything, um, and I had to actually look back and, and uh, at the, uh, the actual SMC, but I, I believe that because I did vote for this at the time, and I think my intent was that this was not necessarily, that this was focused mostly on, on historic redlining. And that the idea would be that if a person could demonstrate in negative impacts from a history of redlining, that we would then prioritize assisting that individual. And does that change if it's based on an action of this city historically that negatively impacts that person or their family? Does that change that it's based on race? Um, so the, there was nothing in the ordinance specific about you're the red correct. riot. You're yeah. correct, yeah. yeah and yeah. I think that was, that was my, my logic and mm -hmm. why I voted for it, but I, I could be different than others on this council. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, 